All right, hello everyone, and welcome to, for the first time ever, an intro, complete introduction to scripting for games um, using Lua and Core as the example. I'm Slinkus. I'm super excited about this. Um, we've got a lot of cool things that um, we can cover with this, and so I'm excited to break down what's really happening in a way that you can use right away and we're going to try to do the whole thing in an hour so if this is too fast in the future i'm going to try to break it into smaller segments if people are still interested in kind of walking through this um and um yeah this should be good for if you are completely new to programming don't know anything about it if you have like some experience with another programming language maybe not lua um and or you know how to program but you don't know how it works in core we're going to cover all of these things if you already know how to program in core um and you're already making scripts and things like that then boy do i have the stream for you because at 4 p.m today chris is doing a stream entitled advanced lua with lasers yeah i i it is the best stream name i've ever heard in my life it's it's the one it is glorious um so yeah if you know some stuff i don't think you need to be super advanced um you can probably still follow along and chris does a really awesome job of explaining so if this is like yeah i know um <laughs> advanced lua with lasers starfeld um I'm psyched. I'm going to be watching it. Um, and yeah, and that's not all. For the rest of the day, we've got some awesome things. So right after this stream, Steve Isaacs, who does a, um, who uh, for Participate, which is like this like online learning community platform um, and has a course, which I'm going to link in the uh, chat right now for discussing the first course on core academy which is an intro to game design it's very like thinking about what makes a good game and a lot less about like how exactly do we make terrain and core that's there too but it's not really like the focus so it's a really good one for discussion and being like okay well how do you approach making games what's a good way to start and it's a little bit biased towards core in that it's really designed to be like i don't know jump in and make some stuff it's core you can just make it you don't like it take it apart make it again um and you know where kind of in in contrast with when you were doing big projects with lots of people you would need like really a lot of very rigorous planning the beauty of core is that you just you just make it you can plan i'm not saying you can't like absolutely plan but you don't have to so that'll be happening at noon hello foreign king welcome um, we're going to be talking about Intro to Lua today. It's going to be awesome. Um, yeah, and if anybody who's here could just emoji in the chat if you have zero programming experience, I'd like to find out if we got some people um, who are ready for this. Um, and then at 2 p.m. today is the patch note stream, so you can find out everything that was just released in the patch, which, by the way, if you haven't launched Core today, go ahead and start downloading that patch. This was a pretty quick one for me. Um, but yeah, it is patch day. And so there's awesome new stuff coming with that. And then again, 4 p.m. Advanced Lua with lasers. I can't, I can't, I can't even with how good a title that is. Um, but yeah, today we are going to be talking about Lua basics. So there's a, actually a document for this um, that I wrote um, with some help uh, from my friends. But um, yeah, so that is now linked to the chat. So if you want to follow along, you want a visual aid besides the visual aids that I'm putting up here, that is a great place to start. Um, and I am going to, I've thought about this a couple times, uh, a little bit, and because it's hard to see things on the event log, this prints out very small. Um, we're actually going to start in REPL. So this is, REPL is just like an online tool for, for me anyway, testing, um, really basic code um and let's hope that i can yeah look how giant we can make this this is fantastic okay so what's gonna happen is we're gonna have output here and the code here we would we would do the exact same thing in core um um, awesome, Starfeld. I'm glad that we, you've got some experience um, and are trying out Core for the first time. That's awesome because I'll definitely hook you up in the context of Core. And right after this, if you want to just see some projects people have made in Core, they're going to be streaming that. Um, so should be very cool. Um, but yeah, we are going to get started with programming like you've never programmed before. 
Lasting Worthwhile Shoutcast is the auto-generated name. Man, they got some good words in there. Okay. So, essentially, at the end of the... Computers form computations, right? And scripts are basically a series of computations for them to f perform. But if that were it alone, it just wouldn't be enough to, like, control the logic of a game, right? So if I do, like, um, I think I can do it over here. If I say 5, pl 4 plus 4, let's say, I get 8. So it can, it's like a calculator, right? But when we're using a calculator, right, besides, like, in math class, if you're using a calculator, the numbers probably refer to something real. And then, like, if I say, okay, so I had four uh, T-shirts, and then I got four more because I went to this super awesome convention and got four more T-shirts, and now I have eight T-shirts, I now have this number that is number of T-shirts I have that I'm remembering, right? And the way you remember a thing, because the computer, you're like, okay, so what was that again? It doesn't know. It's gone. It's done. You didn't ask me to remember it. If you need a computer to remember a program, you're going to use a variable. Um, and a variable is just a name that you give some data so that when I change that data, it stays associated with the name. So I can say... Um, oh, and the keyword we use to do this in Lua is local. I actually don't want to do this here. So let's uh, clear this. Um, and we're going to do it here. So we're going to say local number of t-shirts, right? And I had four, right? And then I say number of t-shirts. And this is a funny thing. Oh, I did a capital. Let's see if we can just fix that there. Shirts of t-shirts is okay it's however many i had before which is number of t-shirts plus i got four more right and then i want to say okay so how many do i have tell me computer and i'm going to use this print command we'll talk about this hello mr isaacs awesome to see you we're jumping to your stream after this um so that people can see stuff that made in core it sounds like we've got some new core people so this is gonna be a really excellent day for bringing people in to you can program games i believe in you I can help you. We can do this. Um, and so we're just going to print the number of t-shirts that we have. And we'll talk about what print actually is and why we have this magic a little bit later. But we're not there yet. Um, so I'm going to do this. And it says eight. I have eight t-shirts. Okay. So I go to another convention. And this time I get like 16 of them. So I'm going to say number of t-shirts is the number I had before. And I know this is like crazy to think about it. Because you just want to be like, well, plus four, right? Um is uh okay and then i got like 16 of them now so now i'm gonna print how many did i have after this um boom okay so on a se secret level we're doing what word plus number and that is because we know the computer knows that if i say number of t-shirts that just means whatever number is here and it just knows that that doesn't mean a, the word number of t-shirts plus the number 16, right? That wouldn't that wouldn't be something that it could compute easily. Um, and um, yeah, so this is, what we're doing is we're making changes. And we can even make changes on the fly. So let's say somebody wants to borrow one of my t-shirts. They want to borrow three of them. So I'm going to be like, well, how many t-shirts would I have? Now, so I'm going to say print uh, number of t-shirts minus three how many would i have okay so we've got and we can actually we can put more print in there so um um sorry i was going to explain these variable types first if you borrowed three of my shirts okay so we're just that's going to be a sentence i'll talk about what that is going on there for a second and what did i do wrong oop i broke it is it not like this? All right. Stop. Play. It's totally happy. So it doesn't actually like me doing this math in here. Um, but uh, we could we could assign it to a variable. Um, the point of the story is, okay, we've got basically three types of variables. We have numbers. Right, which is local no shirts. Let's make the. Uh, that sounds like we have no shirts. Um, uh, we'll just say shirts equals. What did I have last time? Like twenty. Okay. Um, and then we have strings, which are sets of words. So local um, shirt text 
equals core alpha, right? That's what my shirt says, core alpha. Um, okay, uh, and uh, the final thing we have is a Boolean, which is, um, is my favorite and equals true. And the, basically the thing that we're gonna kind of take note of here um, is, sorry, let me annotate that, is that there's basically three ways that I write what I'm assigned to the variable. So if it's a number, and you'll find this is actually totally fine with a decimal number, but I don't have a decimal number of t-shirts. So this, Mr. Isaacs, this is um, REPL. So it allows me right now to just like print. And um, the reason I'm using it is actually very, very simple, which is that um, it allows me to make the text really big because it's all web. So this is a web-based system for running code. And it's great for like, I just want to test some things in Lua. Um, and you can actually, you can actually set up courses in here too. So it's great for teaching programming. Um, I haven't really, but I think that in, we're talking about a new upcoming uh, Lua course. And this may be a place that we put some kind of introductory stuff just so that it's like fast to run. Um, and I'll show you how we're going to run this in core in a second. It's just, it's going to be really hard to see the output. So this is nice. Um, but yeah, so yeah. Um, Basically, if I have a number, I just write the number, and the computer's like, oh yeah, numbers. We know numbers. We we can add, subtract, multiply, modulus, which I'm not going to talk about today, but is like another operation that you can do. A bunch of operations on numbers. Um, and then if I want it to be really anything else, I need to put that in quotes. Because if I just wrote, yeah, core alpha, let's see how fast this thing breaks. Because um, there's a couple things going in here, which is that they are, yeah. So it's basically expected near local. Um, so line six, basically this broke it, so it doesn't know what's happening down here. Because it's like, I, this, cause I'm supposed to core alpha, I don't know what that is. So, but if I put it in quotes, I can put anything I want in there. Because it's just like, just take it as it is, don't mess with it. I mean, there's ways we can mess with it um, and they're called string operations, but for the most part, just don't even worry about it, computer. And that's it. And then with Booleans are really funny, which is basically true and false are keywords. So you see this blue for local and true? These are special words. I can't use them to mean anything besides what they mean to Lua. And to Lua, local means, hey, I'm about to give you a variable. And true means true. <laughs> or false, um, and that's it. And if I want to write, so like in here, what I did is I was like, well, I just want to label on this. And you can see it's this kind of light gray. And the reason it's light gray is because we're trying to be like, this is, it's what's called a comment. It's like, this is just something that's written there for the humans. The humans need to know what's going on, but computer, you don't read this. And so if something breaks, which maybe you guys saw me do, but let's say I break this again, and I'm like, ugh, I don't know. What I do is I take this, and there's actually, there's a shortcut to basically, hey, put these things in me, and I can just toggle it. So on my text editor in here on REPL, it's control slash. Um, actually, I can't ever remember. Regular slash. Um, and that lets me think. So if I do this, and I press play, it's not broken. It's not broken. I lied. Why are you unhappy with me? Oh, it's not broken, and it also wasn't asked to print anything yet. Um, so I can print all of these, and I actually use comma to separate things. So I'll say shirts, shirt text, shirt text, and is my favorite. Okay. Um, so if I print all of these, then right now it's going to break. Uh, okay, it says nil, because it's like, well, I don't know what things is. So that's a third data type that I forgot to mention, which is local new shirt I don't have yet, right, equals nil. So nil is a special keyword, which is I want a variable, but I'm not going to tell you what it is yet. But it is something, and it's going to be something probably, but it's not anything yet. And I use this on like, let's say I've got like, you know, the new winner, and I want to have a variable name for it. But I can't know who that is yet, so I just set something up that's nil so that I can later assign it to them, right? And right now, everything runs all at once, so this doesn't make sense, but we're going to get into that in a second. Um, so nil is another variable. We can add that here. And if I uncomment this and put it back in quotes, then we'll play this, and it'll say 20, core alpha is a string, and true. Um, and those are basically the things. Now, secretly within numbers... Um, two types of numbers. Secretly within numbers, there are decimals, 
local decimal number equals 3.14, let's say, and ints local. Uh, and actually, I'm going to change this to what we actually call it. They're called floats. And they're called floats because basically where the decimal is could be anywhere in the number, right? Is like if I add this and you're asking, like, okay, well, what like spot to is the decimal in? Um, th right now it's there, but I can add more decimals here. I can add more numbers here. And you can't just guess where the thing is. It's floating around. So it's a float. Yeah, I, um, that's, that's a little bit of a Slinkus explanation. Um, and then the opposite is an int for integer. So this is a number that can't have a decimal, um, 23. Now, in some programming languages, not Lua, if I were like, okay, print um, 10 plus 2.5, it would be like, I'm sorry, can't be done, you're insane. That's, that's absurd. Adding an int to a float. Nonsense, right? And so what you'd have to do is you have to say, okay, well, I'm going to convert this, so I'm going to make them both floats so that you can do it. But Lua is actually really flexible. And the only reason I'm bringing up the difference between the ints and floats is because it's going to matter when we get to custom properties. And because the way Core is working is we write our scripts in Lua. Core writes its scripts in C++ because it is on Unreal Engine. So what that means is that um, you can... Your code is going to become C++ when it's actually running in core. Um, and that's uh, a lot of magic. But basically, if I were teaching C++, this would not be a one-hour stream. I promise you that much. Um, so um, Lua is a lot easier, um, I think, than C++ because you, it, it, when you're starting out. Because you really don't have to worry about too many things. Like, you could actually not know that flows and ins are a different number. And it wouldn't be that much of a problem. Um, but um, yeah, so those are our variables. Okay, so now we're going to talk about, we already talked about operations, but basically let's say local, um, we're just going to do A equals 10, local B equals uh, 30, 30. Five. Okay, so I can print A plus B. Uh, uh, control Z, Control C. Ugh. All right. Hopefully there's a shift tab. Yeah. Okay. Shift tab. Absolute magic. Um, what is happening with these colors? Oh, because there's like a slight indent in this. Okay. What happens if I do this? This is very strange. Okay. So Lua indentation matters. Okay. So we do A minus and times and divided by and let's get one more. And we're going to make this up caret, which is how you would do an exponent. Uh, and I remember where it lives. Okay. So, boom. Okay. Um, so, what we have here is the calculations that it did. And we can see that when it did division, it went ahead and gave us a decimal number. So, in some languages, if I had done that, it would just give me basically no remainder. Um, and then this is scientific notation, so this is 10 to the 35th, which is what we asked it to do. If I said A to the 2, then I'd probably get 100, right? Because that's 10 squared. Um, so these are like your ba basic operations. They're pretty useful. Um, uh, yeah, thank you, Tobbs, for talking about the differences between Core and Unreal Engine, um, which is, you know, Core is doing a lot for you, and it's its own kind of system. So it uses the power of Unreal Engine, but it is doing it in a Core kind of way. And the ways that Core does it are actually, like, really very clever when you think about how we're kind of taking all these pieces that everybody has downloaded and then, like, swooping them up into a game so that you can just like jump in at like pew, and it's not this like massive load time and you can you know move between core worlds and stuff like that very cool stuff um okay so this is these are my math operations and then we also have some things that allow me to basically create these booleans um which is i can do comparison so i can say a is less than b um or uh a is less than or equal to B. Um, or let's try this one. A is less than or equal to 10. So we can see that it works. Print. And then 
Um, you'll notice, okay, so we'll talk about the equal signs really quickly, which is right here, every time I want to say, let's make a variable, this is what it's going to be, I use one equal sign. I say A equals 10. A is 10. I have decided and made A 10. If I want to know is A 10, if I want to ask a question, I'm going to use a double equal sign. So I'll say A equals equals 10. Um, and, um, and that, this is, so this is a declaration from me. I'm telling you what it is. Um, and this is a question. So it could be false. I could say A equals equals 11, right? And let's go ahead and play what we've got so far. We've got true, true, and that's false. If I make it 10, then we should get true, 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 which we do now have. Um, so you see this is kind of the output in order from the print statements. Um, and this is really useful when I need to find out, like, say I've got um, local number of players is uh, right now, let's say it's two. And I want to do something with if l the number of players is greater than three, then three, then I would say number of players is greater than or equal to three. It's to say, okay, if there's at least three people. And to do that, I'm going to use if statements. So we'll go ahead and move into that now. So these are called conditional statements, which is, here's the big idea that we're going for here. Right now, everything I've shown you just goes. I'm like, do A plus B, do A minus B, ba da 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 But that is very, very rarely the way we're actually going to use programming. What we need to do is create basically decision trees that are like, okay, in this scenario, this is going to happen. And in this scenario, this is going to happen. And I need you to do some quick calculations here and there. But we can't calculate it all at once because sometimes the stuff that we need to do the calculations doesn't even exist yet. Um, and especially like when I'm talking about number of players in the context of core, core spins up engine, this spins up servers for us, right? So new players can be connecting in the middle of my game. I can't just know how many players there are going to be at the beginning. I don't, or at least it would always be zero um, because there's always zero at the beginning. So we need to have a way to do code that happens when certain conditions are met. So I'll say uh, if, this is how we do it, number of players is greater than or is greater than or equal to three, then um, print we have at least three players, All right? Uh, whoop. Da -da. And then to end an if statement, I'm going to use this keyword end. You can see it's showing up in blue. So again, more special words, special keywords that you can't use. I can't make a variable named if, then, or end because these are reserved, reserved for Lua to use for Lua things. Um, so I'm going to press run and it's not going to say anything because we don't have three players, greater than or equal to three players. So let's go ahead and make it so that we have five players, repress play, and we have at least three players. All right, I'm going to take this back down to two. And oops, a little inspecting here. We're going to add an else. So I don't need an else yet because this is all connected. So we'll say else. Um, and then I don't have a condition with else because this is just literally if this wasn't true, then you're going to do this part. If it was, you did the first part. Um, so we'll keep this end here and we'll say else print not enough players. I don't know why we're capitalizing all of this. Um, a lot of uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a kind of a core thing as we end up using a lot of capital letters because of using capital letters for all of our classes. OK, so now we know it has not enough players because we have two. and We didn't make three. Now we can make a an interim thing. So let's say we have three and we need to have more than three. So we'll say we have three players and we need to have greater than three. We have more than three players, right? And we want an, another one for like we're really close. And so we'll use this else if. Um, and then else if is another condition that is, I'm only going to check if the first one was true. So we definitely, I know we don't have greater than three players. We have to have less than three or three or fewer players. So let's say if we have exactly three players, so number of players equals equals three, then we're going to say print almost enough players. Okay. And so now we know we have three. So we will not have greater than three and we won't get to else if this one is true. This is only one of these is going to happen based on checking each one in order. And we have almost enough players. And if we had two, we could say, boom, not enough. And if we had five, 
we have more than three players. Okay, so that is basically my else if statement. Um, that's awesome, Foreign King, that you're taking a video graphics course and that you're good at making maps. For me, ah, oh, my maps were terrible. I want to think I'm like more of an artistic person, but like I don't know. It's uh, it's very challenging for me. You should see some of the some of the cool stuff people have made where they really like. They can find the space really nicely. It's really awesome to see, I don't know, good level design. It's something I'm working on um, and I'm writing about a lot. Um, and there's a couple streams back where I was talking about map design for the Valorant style game um, that we're pretty into. Um, but uh, yeah. Okay. So the last thing that we need to talk about is a function. Um, and there's sort of four essential components to functions. So we'll go ahead and give this a title, functions. Um, and the keyword that you use to make a function, go ahead and try to guess chat. You won't get a chance before I type it, but the keyword is function. So I create function and just like creating a variable with local, I'm going to give my function a name and the function that I always end up making that no one would ever use because there's an, um, uh, do math magic. Um, and I probably shouldn't have done do. We'll call this math magic. Okay. So let's just say this is like a sequence of, um, okay. Uh, is there a do keyword in this? Am I, now I'm suddenly trying to remember function math magic. I think that's all I do. Okay. And then just like with an if statement functions end with an end statement and I've given it a name and then I've done this thing where I added these parentheses at the end. And that is a lot to do with how we're going to always be talking about functions. You're just going to keep seeing these parentheses. And there is a case in core where we don't use those parentheses and I'm going to talk about it. Um, but what we're going to say is, okay, so I, what I want you to do is I've got, I can make a variable inside of here. I'll say local a is 10 and local b is 20. And then I'm going to say a equals a plus b, right? Which is not a question because it doesn't. This is a declaration. So we're going to change a um, and then b equals a and then a equals b plus a, uh, b times b up b squared, let's say. Um, and then print a, okay. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to separate these sections. Um, and there's a couple of things to notice. One, I'm going to press play and nothing happens. Um, oh yeah, Mr. Isaacs, let me, uh, let me throw that link in there. It, uh, we have it blocked, but, uh, the link that he is referring to, um, foreign King is this one right here. Um, and that is for the participate class and it's super awesome. Lots of interesting discussion going on and it's a good course for discussing. Um, yeah, I know the shop. So the shop actually exists in community content. So it's possible to sort of start using now. We just don't have a lesson about how to hook it up. But if you get into core and you open community content and look for the shop by standard combo, it's the same one he's using in his Valor Strike game that we have streams about. Um, it's the same person who's going to be doing our patch notes at two. So um, that is, it does exist. And then we're going to be kind of breaking it down so that you can use it for your purposes. Um, but yeah, so if I do this, nothing happens. All right, let's try another experiment just so that we understand something kind of complicated, which is if I print A right now, it says nil. And that's basically, if I make a variable inside a function, it is born and dies entirely inside that function. It is like this tiny little micro universe um, that is totally, uh, oh, did it, was it blurry? Ooh, sorry. Um, <laughs> that is totally self-contained. It doesn't know what A is. Um, but we can print a in here, we should be able to. And the answer is, is that functions are recipes. They're like a set of instructions. You're like, okay, when I say math magic, this is what you're going to do. But this on own doesn't say do it. To say do it, I just say math magic with those parentheses afterwards. So now I press play and it's 900. Um, and we could probably go back through the math and figure out why that was, but let's say this was 30 and then B was 30 and then 30 squared is 900. Okay, cool. So that's, that was what's happening there. Um, and this is how I call it. Um, and, um, 
yeah, I forget what the point was there um, with these magic parentheses. So let's say, so this is a function that literally always prints 900. If I say math magic, math magic, it's just going to be like 900, 900, 900. This function is basically standing in for the number, for printing the number 900. It doesn't like do anything. But let's say, okay, that's what happens when A is 10. But let's say I can give it a number. So I'm actually going to say, okay, A, I'm going to put in these parentheses. And I'm going to take it out here. So now A is going to be whatever I tell it to do this time. So I'm going to start with A again, starting as 10, like it did the first time, and then we'll make it two once, and we're going to do something weird, and we're going to make it 3.14 one time. Okay, so now when we run, we get three different answers. And basically, we can use an input to make things. And it's like on my recipe analogy, um, then... Um, like, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to make cookies. What kind of cookies I'm going to make? Ah, well, if it's chocolate chip cookies, I'm going to do this. And so I would supply that as like an input into the whole thing. Um, okay. So right now we're telling it to do something, which is to print something. But this is, this input is called an argument or parameter. And uh, basically the parameter is this A thing. And then the argument I gave it was 10, 2, and 3.14. But you can see basically, it's basically like I made a fair variable A and then I can sign it, which I could also do it here. So let's say, um, it's basically like I said, local A equals 10 and then just use A in here. Because if I took this away, uh, yeah, that'll still work because it's going to look up here for what this was and it's always going to know A refers to this. But then I can't change it here and this is all going to break because it doesn't expect to have anything anymore. Um, so anyway, it's basically like A is going to be like a variable name. It's going to be whatever I give it in parentheses and A is 10 when I called it this time and it's 2 when I called it this time and 3.1 to 4 when I called it the third time. Okay, so those are function inputs and parameters. But let's say I'm not going to tell it to print. I'm just going to tell it that, okay, I want you to give me back whatever's left over at the end of the thing. So I'm going to say return A. So I press play and nothing happens. But all of these, when they operated, they got something back. We just didn't do anything. So what I can do is I can say print <laughs> like this. And we'll skip the middle one just so you can see what's happening. Um, we're going to say, okay, print whatever you got back when I said math magic. Um, and we can even, okay, so uh, if, um, sorry, no parentheses, that's from a different language, A is greater than 100, let's say one, uh, let's say 800, um, print, uh, return, I think I can do this, a big number, um, and, okay, so here's a funny thing, um, which is basically return also ends a function. Um, and you really can't have more than one return, but this works because if I got to this return, it would just stop. It wouldn't even get to the part where it says return A. So let's see if that happens. Uh, oh, sorry, I missed the then. Okay, let's try it again. Boom. So this time it returned a big number and it didn't give me A because it just stops when it gets there. Um, and so that'll keep it from getting to the final one. Okay, so we have done, this is it. That was the intro to programming in Lua. I'm skipping um, loops and tables because um, we'll talk about it kind of in the context of core. Um, but how am I doing time wise? Boom. Four minutes over, but that's all right. We got this. So now we're going to talk about how this works in core. Um, so did I full screen this? Okay, yeah. So now we need to talk about what an API is. So I've shown you the Lua programming language and the Lua programming language has some things built in like if and else and function, right? But it doesn't have move this object over here. But what we did um, in making course, we made an API and that said, okay, we're going to give you a bunch more functions besides like say print was one of the functions that we've used. Um, we're going to give you a bunch more of that that's specific to our game. And when you use it, it will do things related to the game. And basically when you create a bunch of f like functions and information and handles that you can pull, that's an interface, right? Like you, when you drive a car, you have an interface for driving your car. You can't actually just like activate, you know, the 
uh, eject button because that's not one of the buttons that's built into your car. Someone could make that, but it's not in your interface, right? We can't just make up things that would be there. There's a fixed set of stuff you can do. Um, for a night, you don't need to be good at math to code. The computer does it for you. That's the beauty of code. We don't have to ever do math again. Just like computer, math, math yourself. Um, and one of the things we've talked about after the intro to Lua course is talking about some like game math programming. If that is like, oh, I don't know, tell me in chat. I would like to know. Um, and if not, then um, this is a useful thing. So we're going to talk about the core API. So, okay, API means two things. One, it's the set of things you can do. And then the other thing, and you'll see this is pretty common, is the website that tells you what all those things are also gets called the API. So if you're wondering, like, which one is the API, I'll be like, oh, yeah, it's on the core API. And what I mean is on this page that lists the things that are part of the core API. All right, Tubbs, game math it is. We're going to do some vectors. We're going to do some quaternions, which I understood for the first time in Zurishmi's advanced Lua stream. Absolutely magnificent stuff. And so basically this is a set of stuff that you can, information you can get about objects that are in core, um, stuff you can make them do, um, and events that happen when they do stuff. Um, and it is all organized around these things, these capital letter things, which are core objects, um, which means that when I go to, let's see, it's core object, object, boom. This thing is, everything in core is a subset of these things, um, which is, it's really funny because it means like things that don't make sense to have, because, um, okay, so all of them have a is a and a type. I don't know where the core object thing is, but like you'll find basically a bunch of things have like positions and stuff in core. Um, and so these are all the different types of objects we can do. And so we're now we're going to talk about objects. So objects, uh, we're just actually, I'm just going to look at, let's get um, player is a complex one, but it's also a familiar one. So in this player section, I'm going to find three sections. There's the event section, right? The function section, and below the massive amount of functions, because players are a thing we do a lot with. Um, yeah, right? I definitely think I am on Star Trek being like, have you reconfigured the primary power cup? Like every time I say Quaternion, there's like a ching, so mathematical um, about it that I really like. And then a property section. So three sections. So an object has properties and you access those with dots. So I could say player dot name. Um, and actually, I think, I, let's see if I can do a local version of this. Um, so this is about to get weird um, because I basically got, here is what you're normally used to seeing. And then here is this event log. And I'm actually going to bring it down here, bring it down into here, and then make it take up about half this space. So you can still see the world because it seems to pull the world forward if I don't. Um, and then I made a script called demo script, and we're going to open it here. Uh, woof. Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, why are you being weird? Okay, boom. Okay, so now let's just, we'll do a quick overview of what we're doing. To make a script in core, there is a button called Create Script. You, I, to make this demo script, said Create New Script and named it Demo Script. Then I went into Project Content and in the My Scripts tab, it shows up here. To make it run when it starts, I put it in the hierarchy, which is just go right away. And not everything you do, you can make 2D games. Um, there is basically, um, they're not really 2D, so they're like a 2D camera on a 3D game, um, but there is possible ways to do that. And there's also our UI system floats in the front, so that's pretty 2D. So if you look at, um, there's a game, MIDI something, it's like a rhythm game, um, but you can play that and you can see it's very kind of like, you know, the, the ramp like in Guitar Hero is like at an angle, but for the most part, the information is pretty much one plane. And then most of the stuff that you need is just floating in front of you. And so that's kind of like one example of like a 2D interface. And then the other one is that under game components and camera, we have a couple of different, uh, let me make this bigger camera options. So top down, top down is like kind of a three quarters view. Actually, you can kind of see that it's not like full on top down. Now you can kind of adjust where that camera is. Um, and then side scroller is the one that would be most like, you know, your kind of Mario 2D look. Um, and it 
still technically is 3D, um, but I use, because Core is just like so skewed towards like creating 3D worlds, a lot of times for 2D things, I'm using 3D objects. Like when people are making like paintings and stuff, you just take 3D objects and just decrease one axis a lot because there's just a lot more options for things um, there and they're really easy to control. So just, it's where we live in amazing times where 3D is easier than 2D. Who even knew? Um, Oh my god, definitely send me your isometric game. I would love to see it. Um, I spent way too much time trying to learn isometric pixel art. And, I mean, not way too much time, but boy, howdy, was that a challenge. Um, okay, so where was I? So I make a script and then I drag it into this hierarchy to say I want this to be the kind that runs right away. And right now what it does is it prints 2 plus 2. And the place that it prints is this thing called the event log. And it's not open by default. So to open it, you have to go to view and then event log. And then it puts it out there. I could just have it like floating here, um, but it would get covered up. Actually, that's, that's not bad. That's not bad. All right. And then when I press play, it's going to run my script. And what it does is, and this is why I didn't end up doing this in I can't make this bigger this is like the event log so this is a tiny four and you're just gonna have to believe me it is it calculated two plus two and it printed for printed it for me and it was four um, I'm gonna bring this back down here because it's just a little bit easier so the things that I need to be able to access just for this are being able to press a play button to say run the script which I was pressing a play button on the REPL too um, and, um, this, and here's where I'm getting my output. So anytime something's going wrong in my script, I just start printing things to figure out, well, what do you think this is here? What do you think this is here? Am I actually getting the thing that I want or not? Um, okay. So, um, let's talk about, um, I want to... Um, I'm, we're just going to talk about basically how we're going to get reference to an object. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, I don't want to do network context. So I'm going to use what I think is the easiest way to do it, which is an animated mesh. And I'm going to get my girl, Nala. Where are you? Is that her there? Boom. Uh, but yeah, she's my favorite character in the game. Um, and we'll have her look at us. And I'm going to toggle V so that I don't see as much busyness. Okay, so this is Nalo. And I want to make this do something. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the where are you core api uh alt tab boom all right so i was in the player section but nalo this animated mesh is not a player it's an animated mesh okay so i look at this animated mesh and there's actually one event uh all right i haven't talked about these that much um but i the only way i know how to do it is by example so an event is something Basically, okay, awesome, Mr. Isaacs, I will see you on stream. Thank you so much for tuning in. And yeah, hang in on at noon. We're going to be jumping to seeing a bunch of user created, a student created, I don't actually know, but I'm going to find out and I'm excited to. It's 3 p.m. Eastern time, noon Pacific time, and it's right after this. So we're really excited and, um, you know, there's going to be discussion happening afterwards on the, uh, yeah, you don't have to jump over. <laughs> it's It'll be here um, as well. It's going to be everywhere. And um, yeah, and if you want to check out the participate course, they actually have their old discussions on YouTube. So it is not too late to like jump in and just start talking about basically concepts in game design. You do not need to be versed in core to start talking about this at all. This course was really designed to be like, let's just talk about what makes good games at all. And then core is just a really easy way to do it. Um, and a really easy way to do it alone, especially. Okay, so animated mesh, I've got events. And the what events are is, in a multiplayer online game, you can't just say, do this, do this, do this, do this, right? Because you're getting input from different people, probably like across the world from each other. Um, and you're getting all of that input and people are moving around in different, in, in different like, you know, worlds and stuff like that. And they each have basically a version of the game playing on their computer that's updating from a central version that's on a server, right? So I can't just say like do all of this because the whole thing would get out of sync and it breaks really quickly. And if you've ever been in some game where you got like this glitch where like the horse is on top of the building or something like that, a lot of that is these sync errors. Um, that just like it didn't update this the right way to get everything looking thing. So on somebody's computer, it looks totally fine. And on yours, it looks ridiculous. The horse is on top of the ship or whatever. Um, and um, and so one of the things we do to kind of keep this all this synced is have events. So in this case with the animated mesh, there's only one event and that is it does an animation. 
And when it does that animation, it does this event that tells us that it's happening. And it's client only for reasons that... Uh, sparkly visual effects things are all happen on your computer. Because if I needed those sparkles to be on the same, exactly the same between my computer, your computer, and the main server, we basically wouldn't be able to have sparkles anymore. Because it's just like tons and tons of moving things. And it doesn't actually matter if my firework is like, boo, boo, and yours is like, boo, boo. we both saw fireworks. We're fine. Um, and sorry if this destroys a little bit of the illusion of multiplayer games, but it's really important. So... And animated meshes are basically visual effects, right? They're doing a bunch of movement. Um, I guess I haven't explained what they are exactly, which is they're just this like non-collision thing that you can make do stuff um, that looks like a person. Um, and they don't all look like a person. Um, if you look at what our options are, make them big, you can see we've got dragons and foxes and oh, fantasy human guy. Is that from the patch? That must be from the patch. I don't think he was there last time I saw this. But yes, yeah, so now we've got one that's not wearing... All of the people were wearing this outfit before this patch. Um, and so now you've got a guy that makes more sense in a medieval context. But you can actually attach things to them and put like armor on them and stuff. So anyway. Yeah. I'm sorry, Tobbs. I know. I'm breaking your heart. We're not staring at the same fireworks at the same time. It's, I know. Heartbreaking. But um, yeah. So uh, what we we've got is... Sorry, we need to go back up to Animated Mesh. Take me to the Animated Mesh. Animated Mesh. All right, we've got one thing. And then these functions are all stuff you can do with this Animation Mesh. Animated Mesh. So you can get the socket name. Sockets are where you would attach the, like that armor and stuff. So I can say, all right, just tell me all of the sockets. Um, I can call an attach core object and I say on this animated mesh, attach a core object. And then here, the same way we supplied A as the number, we're going to give you the core object to attach and the string, which is the socket name that we want to attach it to. Um, and the one that we're going to try right now is play animation with the animation name. Um, and um, is it just called wave? Oh, I should probably check this. Do I have a, I have a list of all the animation names, right? Um, I have a list of all the human ones, but, um, there is, there is a project by the way, where you can just play with animated meshes and see all the things that they can do. So I highly recommend you. It's literally a game. You can also like, uh, make a copy of it for you to edit locally. Um, yeah, hella fashion. Um, so what we want to do is we want to say, okay, I need to have a way for my script to know about this. Cause if I'm just like local animated mesh, it doesn't know what I'm talking about. Um, because I, it, the script is here and the animated mesh is sort of in my project, but they need a way to talk to each other. And it's not as easy as just making a number because it knows that numbers exist. Um, so the way that we're going to do that is we're going to add a custom, mm, there's two ways we could do it. Um, uh, we're going to, uh, okay, we're going to do it. We're going to do it the funky way. Okay. Which is I'm going to drag, uh, you see, I've got demo script highlighted and I'm going to drag it onto human gal. And if you look at it now, demo script is sort of like indented and it's basically inside of human gal, or you could say demo script is a child of human gal and human gal is its parent, right? So I can actually close it up and I don't see the script anymore. So now in demo script, I can say local animesh is script, that's me, dot parent. And we could just print it, print animesh. And I do this all the time. Anytime I'm programming, literally I just like make a variable, print it right away because I need to make sure that it's doing what I think it's doing. Um, so we'll pull up our thing here. We will control s to save this and then i'm going to press play and it says down here you'll have to believe me it says animated mesh and then there's a long string of numbers and that's actually an id so what's happening right now in the game is this is my character version of nalo and then this is nalo the animated mesh and you'll notice i can oh i did not know she had collision they have collision okay cool um and we're probably about to change that. So I'm going to create new con networking context. And so that whole thing about how the animated mesh ha has to happen um, on, uh, this is not gonna work. So I pull this out and then I'm gonna put these in here. 
um, which is basically if I wanted to move, that's a, like a visual effect, which means that needs to be client side. We need to be like, okay, waving's going to happen. Everybody's going to wave, but it's going to happen on your computer and not like the server is like hand is here, hand is here. Everyone sees exact hand motion. Um, and uh, yeah, we don't want that. So now we're going to take out this print because we know now what it does. And I'm going to say anim mesh and I can, all right, you know, we'll print something else. So we're going to print and we're going to try one of these properties. So let's look at the properties available for the animated mesh. Hmm, don't need the REPL anymore. Where are you? Okay. Yep. Yeah, so properties that we have are animation stance, animation stance should loop, um, and it's basically because animated meshes are meant to be animated. So let's go ahead and find out its animation stance. So we'll say anim mesh, that's, you know what, let's call this uh, not low mesh. I think, I someone tell me if that's not actually this character's name. I like mess up the vowels on it all the time. Um, so we're gonna say, just so it's not like all animated meshes and we know it's this one in particular. So not low mesh. Uh, dot, what did we say, animation stance? All right, so we'll print that and we press play, we save first and then we press play. And it says, um, and you'll have to believe me on this, um, I'm gonna copy it, I'm gonna paste it into here just so you can see. Um, unarmed, idle, relaxed, which is, uh, that's a fair description of what's happening here. And then the other thing is that you can actually change these um, animation or the animation stance it's actually a property on it so if I look here stance unarmed idle relaxed it was the, the information was available here but I just want to see okay this is a property and I can access it so now what we want to do is we want to do a method so we're gonna say nalo mesh and then when you do a method which is sorry a function um, which is uh, these here, they all start with capital names. And it's basically properties you'll always see with lowercase and you're gonna use dot to get them. Um, foreign Knight, awesome to meet you. Excited to see more of your stuff on core in your isometric game. And um, fake zombie craft, I don't, I don't know about never, but what I know is that the way core works is about everybody has these building blocks downloaded and we can just droop, 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 droop them into place for your instance of the game um and it makes it so fast and especially if you've used another platform you can just feel it's so fast and like i don't i don't i don't want to like flex on you right now but i am about to show you my greatest accomplishment um which is, yeah, this milk crate. Behold, no blender involved, sir. Friend, uh, sorry. Um, this is just, I modeled all of this using core parts. It's a lot of core parts. I'm not going to lie to you. It's quite a few. Um, and one of the ways you can kind of like deal with like the way too much collision that that creates is there's basically a box around it um that is the collision and these are all basically client side they're like the mesh i can i see right now i should be able to just walk through this mesh no problem yeah um so and that that saves a lot of computation power um so you don't have like the ability like in blender to like create lots of vertices um but essentially like you can do a lot and it just takes a little while i think when you've got one workflow from blender to get used to this one um and like i you know some things are harder than others so like i was trying to make like hanging fabric and it's really hard to find the right shape for that but it's kind of like the world is your your oyster if you just kind of start getting used to a slightly different core way to do it and the benefit is like mega fast load times, which when you're talking about putting something like online for people to connect to on a server, you can't prioritize that enough. And like, honestly, if I had to like actually go back through an old project and optimize it, that would be, that would be hell. Um, so we are going to make this animated mesh do things though, if it kills me and to call a method. So the method that we're going to call, sorry, I'm jumping around between topics, but that's because this is all excited exciting is we're going to do play animation so i'm going to use a colon write play animation and i'm going to need the animation name and that's all i need right now um and i'm going to put it in quotes because it says that it needs a string so we'll say nalo mesh play animation and the animation i think it's just wave it might be unarmed wave we'll find out if this breaks so saving that pressing let's pressing play 
And animation string way provided to animated mesh human gal. Okay, so I can actually go in here and there's auto complete in this. So if you um, go in here, what do we want? Unarmed. I don't know if you guys can see this is sort of low on my screen. Unarmed. No, we could try throw use unarmed wave. Okay, so it's unarmed underscore wave, right? So this we give it a string, but it needs to be a string that it knows about. Because again, this is an interface, right? There's a set of different things. Um, well, what kind of plugins are you thinking? Um, just uh, uh, Fake Zombie said, um, why not make, if there's no Blender support, why not make plugins? I'm kind of, I'm interested. We're definitely, you know, I will forward feedback and suggestions to people. I, I, I you know, we talk about what, community want all the time this is one of our favorite topics of conversation um so we got play animation and unarmed wave and when i do that bam look at that she's waving so that is awesome um and that is kind of like my basic look at we can do this but there are these magnificent things so we've talked about this is a core object the core object has properties we talked about properties and we talked about um methods right which are or functions which are this when i use colon and i tell it to do something right and one of the, sometimes i use a function to tell it to give me information like a property and that's sort of like there's kind of some magical reasons involved in why you would end up using a method to say if it starts with get then it's like a property it's just giving you information um but sometimes your get and your set are separate um and that's um I don't know. You just have to look at the API doc to see what it's going to be for your individual thing. And um, yeah, sorry guys, we've got a plug in here. And that is, so now what we're going to talk about is an event and we're also going to talk about the script generator. So um, let's see, what is the easiest thing I can do for this? Um, what I want to do is I'm going to change this slightly. So right now I've got a cli client context and I've got this demo script and the demo script figures out what the knowledge mesh is because it's the parent. Hmm. I don't, am I going to break? How do I do the trigger if the client side? Hmm. Hmm. Um, I don't think this is a problem. Okay, anyway, I'm going to take my script out. So my script is not going to be, um, it's going to be independent of this. And I'm going to say, okay, but I want you to know what this this animated mesh is. And the way I can do this is because it has these things. You see where it says, I don't know if you guys can read that. It says add custom property. And I can add custom property and I can, this is actually why we talked about int and floats before. Um, it lets me pick the types of properties that I know about. So colors are objects in core um, and things like that. Um, I wonder if I could uh, change her t-shirt color. That'd be kind of cool. Um, yeah, well, I won't get too much into this, but essentially like I can make a variable and then use it in the script. So that means that like I could basically change it here inside of properties and I don't have to go like edit the script. And for things that I want to be able to change like that, it makes sense to put them there. Not everything, right? Not the like, okay, so tell me the location of the thing there. That's not something I would want as a custom property. Um, but um, I can also basically take this human gal, add her here as a custom property, and it gives me, it says human gal here and human gal, and then it gives me this variable, local prop human gal equals, control script, and I'm just going to paste it in here, because there's no chance you can read it on there. Oh. Um and let's head back. But yeah, it said prop human gal and it says script. And then it uses this method that you could use on a script, which we could look up. Oops. We could look up the script things, which is get custom property. And then it has a name, which is human gal. I um, mean, you can see it's the no space version. So it's exactly what's written here. And then it says wait for object, which is another method. And that is because the object is inside of the hierarchy. And what that means is when the game is loading, it's loading all of the objects. Um, and so, um, what that means is it doesn't exist at the exact same second that the script exists. Um, and it would break things if it was looking for something that doesn't exist yet. So it has this method that says, just like, hold up, hold up, just like wait for something to load that matches this description. And it's actually probably doing this using the ID. So it knows which one we're talking about. 
Um, and then, so what I'm going to do is so that I, I now Nalo mesh doesn't exist. And what I have is this variable that created for me prop human gal. So we can do this. We can paste this in. We can save this and have the glorious experience of uh, demo script for server script attempted to access a client only object. <sighs> okay, so I'm going to put this demo script back in here. Let's see if that fixes it. Blam. Server side script. Glorious. Okay. Um, so that's what we've got going on there. Do triggers work on client side? They must. Okay. Um, and what we want to do is instead just having her. Um, how am I doing on time wise? I am. It is noon. Okay. So that is as far as we got. I think on Friday, we're going to change the subject to um, working more on this. And we're going to talk about more of like the core context of Lua. If people liked that, get on the discord core Academy channel for all of your requests about stuff that you would like to see covered that you are curious about. And you want to see more coverage of, especially um, probably don't have that many Spanish speakers on the stream right now, but I will do a stream in Spanish. Uh, if, P if that is what the people want. So post your feedback and things like that, and then stay tuned to see the um, participate crew, Mr. Isaacs and a Mr. Washburn um, talking about uh, user-created content in core. Thank you guys for tuning in. This has been Salinkus. See you guys later.